Chemotherapy is one of the most popular topics of conversation in the comments sections of my videos, and one of the most persistent supposed facts that is repeated on the internet about chemotherapy is that it only works 2% of the time. So in this video I'm going to respond to this claim specifically. Now this 2% statistic is also sometimes given as chemotherapy fails 97% of the time. Now I know there's a missing 1% here, but I'm pretty sure they both track back to the same source. In its most hyped form, this number is also given as chemotherapy kills 97% of cancer patients, as if any sentence including the number 97 and concerning chemotherapy might as well be true. Anyway, let's listen to Peter Glidden, not a medical doctor, introduce this supposed fact in a video for iHealthTube. There was a study that was published, I believe it was in 1994. They did a meta-analysis of these people all around the world who developed cancer as adults for 12 years and were treated with chemo. And they looked at the results. And they published the results in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And the results? The results? 97%. Of the time, chemotherapy does not work. Now Peter Glidden gets so much wrong here it's hard to believe he's ever read the paper. First off, he got the name of the journal and the publication date wrong. The research he's referring to was published in 2004 in Clinical Oncology, not 1994 in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And it wasn't a 12-year program. What the authors actually did is search the medical literature for the period between 1990 and 2004. So Peter Glidden has turned a fairly restrictive search strategy into what sounds like a rather impressive study duration. It wasn't a meta-analysis either, but the authors did use data from other meta-analyses, and while some of the data in this paper might have been sourced from trials that were conducted around the world, the authors only calculated the contribution of chemotherapy to survival for the USA and Australia. So let's take a look at the paper ourselves, and I imagine this will be a first for almost everyone who's ever referred to its findings. Now the point of the paper was to try and calculate what percentage of adult cancer patients for a selected range of cancers are alive at five years due to the use of chemotherapy. It's right there in the title of the paper, and I want to make one thing really clear right now. Saying that the overall contribution of curative and adjuvant cytotoxic chemotherapy to five-year survival in adults is estimated to be 2.3% in Australia and 2.1% in the USA is in no way equivalent to saying chemotherapy only works 2% of the time. These two statements might sound similar, but they actually have different meanings. And it goes without saying that this doesn't mean that chemotherapy kills 97% of patients. So how did the authors come up with this 2% contribution? First, they used publicly available data sets to work out how many adults were diagnosed with certain types of cancer in the USA and Australia. Let's keep things simple by looking at the numbers for Australia. So after listing the number of people with each cancer in 1998, they pulled data from various trials and meta-analyses to work out which subgroups chemotherapy would be effective for. Let's take ovarian cancer, for example. In 1998, 1,207 people in Australia over 20 were diagnosed with this type of cancer. The authors looked at the medical literature and found a clinical trial from the 1980s which showed that people with advanced disease are likely to benefit from chemotherapy. Of these 1,207 people, 79% had advanced disease. Then the authors used the survival benefit of chemotherapy to work out what percentage of these people are alive at five years due to chemotherapy. In the case of ovarian cancer, the absolute benefit of chemotherapy the authors used was 11%. So bringing all this together, we can work out that after five years, 105 people are alive who would not have survived without chemotherapy. Now the authors repeated this process for each type of cancer and in the final analysis they simply tallied the number of people diagnosed with cancer and the number of survivors due to chemotherapy and then worked out the overall percentage which in Australia is 2.3%. So before I get into what I think are the problems with this paper, I want to first point out that it does in fact dramatically demonstrate the efficacy of chemotherapy. If you cite this statistic or this paper because you think it proves that chemotherapy doesn't work, you're simply wrong. 
In Australia alone, that 2.3% equates to 1,690 people alive at five years who would otherwise have been dead, and this number will add up to tens of thousands of people around the world. Now, of course, you can argue, as the authors of this paper do, that chemotherapy might not represent value for money. Or you could argue that it doesn't live up to the expectations of patients or the hype of the media and drug companies. But it is a departure from reality and indeed the data in this paper to conclude that chemotherapy doesn't work when the paper says nothing of the sort. In fact, the authors calculated remarkably good results for several types of cancer, including a 42% contribution of chemotherapy to survival in cancer of the testes. I think the biggest problem with this 2.3% statistic is that it includes in the calculation people who would never be prescribed chemotherapy. People with prostate cancer or kidney cancer are almost never given chemotherapy because it normally doesn't work. So what's the point in including them in this sum? Likewise, various subgroups within certain cancers are also unlikely to be prescribed chemotherapy with the intention to extend their life. I'm going to use an analogy here. If I told you that only 1% of people survived an automobile collision because they were wearing a motorcycle helmet, you might be led to conclude that wearing a helmet is pretty much a waste of time. The headlines might read, Motorcycle helmets fail 99% of the time. But what if I then told you that I included in my calculation people who were driving cars, and therefore not wearing a helmet? I don't think it takes a genius to realise the problem with this. If we want to know how well helmets can protect people when they crash, rather than considering all road users, we might want to look at just motorcyclists. In the case of cancer, if we want to know how much chemotherapy contributes to increasing survival, I would argue that it makes more sense to consider only the people who are actually given chemotherapy to extend their life. I'm not the only person to think this, nor the first. In fact, a letter to the editor published shortly after this paper was highly critical. The letter opened with the following lines. Sir, we read with interest the paper by Morgan et al. which claimed to assess the contribution of curative or adjuvant cytotoxic chemotherapy to survival in adults with cancer. We are concerned that their approach underestimates the contribution of chemotherapy to the care of cancer patients by using all newly diagnosed adult patients as a denominator despite the fact that chemotherapy is not indicated for many of these patients. The magnitude of the benefit in many subgroups is obscured. I'm going to come back to this letter later, but I wanted to pause on their point about the denominator. If all newly diagnosed adult patients isn't the clearest denominator, what could we use instead? Well, I'm going to suggest that we use the data given in the paper. Let's exclude every cancer where the authors calculated no benefit for chemotherapy, and instead include only patients in the subgroups where chemotherapy was shown to be effective. I'll link a spreadsheet which I set up below to make this calculation, strictly using the numbers from the paper. Just a note here, I am not claiming this to be a perfect analysis, it's a ballpark number and there are problems with working it out like this. For example, some patients excluded from my calculation would have received chemotherapy. If you've got a better idea, you're welcome to share your calculation and wisdom in the comments. Disclaimers aside, what happens if we exclude from the denominator those patients who are either not given chemotherapy or are unlikely to benefit from it? Well, the number of survivors is, of course, the same, but now we have a different denominator and the percentage contribution of chemotherapy to five-year survival has increased from 2.3% to 9.1%. I'm also not the first person to have this idea. A blog by Anax Imperator arrived at a figure of 8%. They didn't show their working for this number, but they did make some other interesting points, which I'll also get back to. So where are we up to now? Well, we've looked at how this 2% figure was arrived at, we've seen that the paper supports the efficacy of chemotherapy, and we've seen that by using all newly diagnosed patients, the benefit from chemotherapy can be underestimated. So let's get back to the letter to the editor published in 2004 and see what other criticisms were leveled at this paper. They criticised the reliance on five-year time points which will underestimate the efficacy of chemotherapy in preventing late relapses. They point out that chemotherapy is also beneficial in advanced cancer where it increases median survival rates. They also note several inaccuracies and omissions including the exclusion of leukemias and other types of cancer that chemotherapy can cure. I'm going to read from the conclusion of this letter. Although we fully agree that there is a need for evidence-based assessments of all treatments, the contribution of this type of analysis with pooling of all cancer patients is questionable and potentially misleading.
As I said earlier, I wanted to get back to the Anax Imperator blog post because I think the author makes a very good point here. Let's take an example of two people with cancer, one with leukemia and one with early stage breast cancer. Now in the first case, the absolute benefit of chemotherapy might be 60%. Chemotherapy is very effective for treating leukemia. And in the second case, the absolute benefit of chemotherapy is 0% because it is not used to treat women with early stage breast cancer. Now if we applied the mean average here, we could say that the absolute benefit from chemotherapy for these two people is 30%. But does that really help us here? Would either of these two patients benefit from this calculation or information? Well, clearly not. It would only serve to encourage the breast cancer patient to take chemotherapy and confuse the leukemia patient about how effective the treatment is. And that is what this paper does on a grand scale with 20 different cancers at all stages of progression. And that is because this paper was never meant to inform individuals on the best course of action for their disease. But of course, when we get to the conspiracy blogosphere, they absolutely use it to try and inform individuals on their own treatment, even when the type of cancer is known. Let's take this classic example of bungled blogging from Chris Walk over at Chris Beat Cancer. In this blog post, a man has written in to discuss his personal cancer story with Chris, and of course he tells Chris what kind of cancer he is suffering from. And where does Chris open up? Well, by talking about himself, of course, and then straight into the scary 2% number. And you shouldn't be surprised to learn that Chris also got the description of this study wrong and quoted the wrong numbers. I guess he didn't read the paper either. Later in this blog post, Chris does go on to talk about the specific information on his subscriber's cancer, which begs the question, what was the point in introducing the 2% number at all? Well, Chris's garbage coaching is hardly going to sell itself. I'm sure the fear helps people hand over their credit card details. So one of the last things I want to say on this subject is that we need to be really careful when we use words like work. In many cases, chemotherapy isn't given to extend a person's life, but rather reduce the symptoms of cancer, including pain and excessive growth of tumors. In this case, the purpose of chemotherapy is palliative. We can't evaluate whether or not chemotherapy is working by measuring how long someone lives in cases like this. Imagine someone with a gunshot wound is given morphine. They don't have to live any longer than someone without morphine for us to say that the drug is effective for its purpose. Patients who become afraid of chemotherapy might refuse the significant palliative benefits. I'm going to quote from this book by Rose Shapiro discussing what happens when people turn to ineffective alternative therapies. There are now reports of cases of advanced, untreated cancer producing catastrophic symptoms that doctors have not encountered for decades. For retired Australian surgeon Peter Moran, who has written extensively about alternative medicine and cancer, the concern is not merely the as yet rather small number of lives lost unnecessarily, it is the foregoing of the very substantial palliative benefits that conventional methods can offer. Now this paper was not concerned with palliative chemotherapy, but I thought this point was worth bringing up in a discussion about whether or not chemotherapy works. So the final thing I want to say about this paper is that it's now old. It was published in 2004 using cancer incidents from 1998 and considered trial data from the 80s, 90s and early noughties. A lot more research has happened since and cancer survival rates continue to rise. To the best of my knowledge, no one has ever repeated the exercise in this paper with updated numbers. Not even the original authors thought it was worth doing again. But they have gone on to author numerous other articles on the treatment of cancer with chemotherapy and radiotherapy, so obviously they weren't alerted to the fact that they'd already proved chemo doesn't work. At the end of the day, there just isn't much sense in considering all chemotherapy drugs grouped together like this. Even if you're trying to assess how cost-effective they are, it's still better to consider all treatments for each disease individually. The thing that most people want to know when they start researching chemotherapy, though, is not how cost-effective it is on a broad scale, or even what the contribution to five-year survival in adult malignancies in Australia is. The kind of questions I presume people have are things like, Will chemotherapy make me live longer? Or will the side effects of chemo be worth it for my mother? And these kind of questions are complicated. You'd have to look at the latest meta-analyses, the latest papers on how chemotherapy affects quality of life. You'd probably want to know if there are any clinical trials on new treatments that you might be eligible for. And these aren't really trivial questions to answer, especially if you or someone close to you is suffering from cancer. Now, fortunately, there are people who can help you. No, not conspiracy bloggers and YouTubers. The best people to help you are oncologists, and that's who you should talk to.
Now, I'm sure that the enthusiastic chemotherapy conspiracy theorists will continue repeating the 2% statistic, even if they watch this video. For some people, the opportunity to quote a low number and scare people for views and money is simply irresistible. And I understand, of course, after all, who would want to watch a video of Peter Glidden correctly describing the methodology and results of this study. Probably about as many people as actually read the paper. Okay, so this video took me ages to finish, um, just arranging all the clips and recording the audio. So sure, if you liked it, please like the video and subscribe to my channel for some more videos like this. I think the next one is going to be on Agenus von der Planets, the guy who advocates eating rotting and raw meat. And sometime in the next month or so there'll be a 420 subscriber special and I'll try and respond to some comments that I keep getting again and again. And oh, I have a Facebook page now as well as a Twitter and if you're into those kind of things I'll try and post some more stuff on Facebook and you could message me on there if you want.